Podrían tomar asiento, por favor. I would ask you to please take your seats. Foreign guests, we are going to at least have most of the session take place in English. This session has to do with delivering the promising future. We have in front of us uh, uh, the co-chairs plus uh, a member of the board of the World Economic Forum, Luis Alberto Moreno, who are here to tell us what they are concluding, what conclusions, what impressions they take from this session, from their stay in Peru. And uh, I'm supposed to introduce all of you, each of you, but I suggest you introduce yourselves and uh, with a short statement of who you are. And uh, we'll start with you, madam, and keep on going down the road. I'm Valerie Amos. I'm responsible for humanitarian affairs for the United Nations. I'm Michel Lies, the CEO of Swiss Re Reinsurance Company, based in Switzerland. I am uh, Gérard Mestralet. Chairman and CEO of uh, GDF Threads, a French group present in energy and the environment and present here in Peru. I am uh, Luis Alberto Moreno. I am the president of the Inter-American Development Bank that is the main regional development bank for Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, a chairman of Intercorp, a group that invests primarily in Peru. Thank you very much. We will start a question to you. One of the issues that, of course, we have uh, coming from Latin America, well, coming from any country, but at this time when uh, a recession began in 2008 and there's so many things that have uh, changed, uh, what in your, uh, as you conclude what you've seen from here, what could we improve in terms of confronting the notion of risk in Latin America? Well, I was very struck over the last couple of days that the conversation around uh, growth included a conversation around the need for tr social transformation. And I think that uh, in this region, we, in the work that I do, of course, we focus a lot on the impact of natural disasters on the region and the way that that can actually wipe billions uh, off uh, the GDP of any particular country. But I think that there is something that is even more important than that, uh, which talks to this issue of social transformation. Because as you have growth, you also have a region where you have increasing inequality. And there's been a lot of talk uh, over the last couple of days also about uh, the importance of education. And in my conversation uh, with the Global Shapers this morning, I was also struck by uh, their view that although this is an economic forum, we needed to integrate some of the issues around how do we talk about uh, people's rights uh, as well as the responsibilities and, you know, that shared notion of rights and responsibilities between uh, citizen and state. Uh, so for me, a, a very important uh, takeaway in terms of how do we deal with these issues of uh, risk and uh, resilience is not just about disaster, it's about the nature of the continent and the countries of the continent as a whole and how you tackle essentially those issues of vulnerability and inequality. And what you're saying, since you mentioned the word education and you mentioned the word right, is that education is a right and a fundamental one? Is that where you're going? Well, I think it depends on uh, where you sit uh, and uh, whether you have to pay for it or not. Um, so I think that countries make those kinds of decisions about is education a right and are we going to pay for it and what can, can we afford to pay for? I certainly personally uh, think that if we're going to have the kind of trans social transformation that we're looking for globally, then the right to education is a fundamental and important principle that underpins that. But that in no way is about making a judgment about the decisions that individual countries then take about how they try to uh, enshrine that. Uh, but I think that the presidents talked a lot yesterday about the importance of education. Uh, it's something that I think we all recognize. Monsieur Lier, 
you are here not, uh, I pronounced it right. Yes, uh, again, I insist as an insurer, never forget the accent because being called lies would be terrible. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, let's make sure then, Monsieur Lier, and emphasize that we're going to get from you the truth and only the truth. Uh, how do you see, uh, in, uh, as you go away from here, the nature of cooperation between the private sector and the state? which happens to be, of course, a current theme in Peru and is always a theme uh, all over the world. I think there is a lot of the, of the discussion uh, between state and the private sector, which is about also making a kind of inventory of the, of the needs. Uh, I think that uh, the state is there also to have a, a good understanding about the needs and the cooperation that the private sector can bring to the table. And, and the mistake that probably we, we should not do is trying to uh, simply uh, bring solutions without knowing exactly what are the problems that we are answering to. And uh, in, in several segments, I think we need to have a, a better understanding because the, the environment is not the same probably as the one that we're experiencing in other places. And understanding this environment, understanding what are the problems before elaborating the solution is something which is extremely important. I, I believe in, 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 in my industry, uh, we are very, very dependent of uh, the evolution of the middle class, and that's definitely something that we share as an interest uh, with the states, the evolution and the speed at which the, the, the middle class is built in the countries. But uh, beside that, we know that uh, in, in many cases, disruption are uh, quite a burden to the, the budget of the, of the state, and uh, that is something that we need probably to understand better in order to uh, make sure, in the case of the industry of reinsurance or insurance, that we can help with solutions which are probably not the most classical one, but uh, solutions which are rather innovative, be it at the macro level, meaning uh, that we can bring the chip of insurance, if I may say, at the state level, being at the micro level, bringing uh, insurance to people who are, for the current environment, absolutely excluded from this kind of, uh, of activities. So I think this inventory is extremely important just in order to avoid creating solutions to problems which did not exist and oh, forgetting creating the real solution to the real problems. How do you, at the level, at the macro level of insurance, at which you work, try and connect to the bottom that person who is without insurance. Are there any initiatives that you've taken? Anything that you've looked at in particular? Or is it just a concern? No, no, it's, it is simply the way to realize that we cannot simply sit down and wait that full Latin America is middle class and everybody is taking care of their own future by themselves. So we need to complement that in the, in the, if I may say, the bottom-up part by trying to elaborate things which are a little bit more simple but extremely effective for the people so that they can effectively take advantage of this technology. But also, I would say at the state level, realizing that in the majority of the cases, more than 75% of the economic burden of a disruptive event is falling on the shoulders of a government. I'm deeply convinced that uh, government could gain quite a lot of learning a little bit of what insurance technology can bring to their way of approaching their budget. Mm -hmm. Just a, a question that crosses my mind. In the United States, for example, a lot of the duties that uh, the state accepts in uh, Europe, like for example, guarantees on credit and uh, even uh, the possibility of subprime mortgages and the records behind it and all the mechanisms of the registre foncier, they have passed to the private sector in forms like title insurance. Have you, when you're talking about a relationship of that sort, do you see any possibility of an intervention on part of the insurance to help the state reach the classes that are not covered? Definitely yes, but I, don't, I, I think it's, it's probably more a kind of 
distribution concern. Uh, the, the, the technology, if I may say, exists. I think what we need is uh, having an intense cooperation with the people who can help us distributing this product to the, the lower level. So it's not defining the risk in a different fashion, having a, an American approach compared to a European approach, but probably it's more the help that the state can bring to give access to the middle class of tomorrow, because I, I prefer to defer, to define these, these people as the middle class of tomorrow to, to this type of product, which in a normal environment are only accessible to the, the official middle class. Uh, Monsieur Mestrayer, uh, one of the issues here has been that Latin America has grown, Peru has grown, and probably too much, some people say, on the basis of luck, good commodity prices. Now, anybody can do that. So what happens when commodity prices go down? And the question is, since in some cases they are going down, and uh, whatever happens, the commodity sector is also a place where there are social conflicts. Uh, one of the solutions, of course, always, I mean, the whole idea of wealth is the idea of the division of labor, moving away from just the commodity itself to uh, giving added value to the commodity by uh, combining it with all sorts of other resor resources. How do you see Latin America in that sense today, since you currently visit us? Are we getting there? Or have we started? Are we fully conscious? Well, we, we have been following the, the situation in the countries where we operate in uh, Peru, uh, Chile, Brazil, Panama, and a few others. Uh, it's true that the, the, the transition uh, from uh, commodity-driven, natural resources-driven economy uh, to a more uh, shared um, uh, value-added uh, economy has started in, uh, in most of those countries. It's more or less uh, the case today in, in Europe, uh, but there are some fundamental differences. Uh, I see the world going with three speeds. The, the emerging world with a, a strong growth, even if it is perhaps not as strong as it was two years ago, um, but there is growth and therefore there are needs for additional energy. There is the North America, with the special case because of uh, shale gas and shale oil, uh, which are really um, game changers for the energy and therefore for the economy. And there is Europe, where uh, unfortunately today we have no growth, and since we are active in energy efficiency, energy savings, we are in a negative energy growth. So back to Latin America. The, um, first of all, because of growth and to fuel the growth in the sector of energy, we need to be able to supply um, the natural resources, uh, industries, with enough electricity, enough natural gas, and in quantitative terms. Now, uh, the question is, um, this growth is creating wealth, how this wealth can be shared with the population and with the, the future generations. Some countries have decided to save some of that wealth in, uh, in funds, investment funds, that invest uh, in infrastructures and that do not um, make uh, current expenses with that wealth. So it's a way to transfer some of that wealth created today to the future generations. Um, and this is a, a one way. The, there is another way which is to, to share with a, a larger part of the population. And today our, our role is to, to try to accompany this uh, transformation of the, the, the model. In a um, uh, commodity-driven, classically, uh, you have big plants, big mines, um, and in the energy sector, big power plants, big hydro projects. And now we are shifting this classical model to a more distributed model because of the technology, 
the renewable um, the, the renewable equipments to, to produce power are smaller and closer to the territories, closer to the consumers, individual consumers. Some of the consumers want to, to become producers. So this uh, transition, which is a, a transformation, deep transformation, a mutation, um, is already present in uh, in Europe today, this is a major change. Even if there is a decline in the global demand for energy, within this global declining uh, demand, there is a deep transformation in the way electricity, energy is produced and consumed. Energy efficiency is a key word today, and this has to happen also in Latin America. So, the, the new model, which is already quite in place in Europe, will be, of course, applied differently here because the first duty is to, to supply the industry with enough energy. Without energy, there will be no growth, and without growth, there will be no prosperity, no wealth. So there is a, a quantitative um, need that we have to satisfy, but at the same time, and this is a challenge for, for Latin America, at the same time, the business model, the, the model and the social model has to be uh, changed in order to, to have a more um, uh, shared value creating uh, economy. And for that, I think that the, the, the key word is uh, the dialogue, uh, as Mr. Lies uh, explained, between uh, public and private uh, um, uh, partners between the private operators and the governments uh, with the regulators. By the way, it is essential uh, to have a stable and visible and efficient regulation for the investors that have to invest in the very long term, like in the energy sector or the mining sector. Uh, having a, a stable regulation is a, 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 a key factor for, to favor uh, investment. So the dialogue has to be done with um, uh, the governments, the regulators, but also uh, local authorities, uh, NGOs, in, in, uh, in order to, to build all together uh, the, the new model of the uh, shared uh, added value. Well, I can see, Mr. Mistrayer, that you are very socially conscious, and your company obviously is too. Just a side question. Did you see the film Avatar? Yeah. How did you feel? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I saw. Did it, do you think it reflects reality? Do you think it's, uh, it's uh, because it was a film that had a lot of effect around here, and it had less to do with the macro and much more to do with the local people. How, does the, how would you react to that film if you found no, you, uh, a chief of state of Latin America that was painted no. blue. No, that's, that's the occasion for me to, 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 to explain more, perhaps more in, more in details our approach. Um, in, our, in our business, we are in energy and also the environment, we are in water distribution. Um, we consider that, and I consider that we are in charge uh, of a part of the uh, public interest and general interest, because our role our, uh, is to supply the population uh, with uh, light, with uh, heat, um, with electricity, with water, w which are essentials uh, of life. And, uh, um, and, and, and therefore, to, to build a sustainable business, uh, we need to take in, in account all the interests of the, or the whole the population. If we would not do that, at a certain moment, the business would be stopped, blocked, uh, be, because there would be a, a, a gap between the business itself and the real needs of the population. At the end, we have to make a profitable business. And by the way, we are a profitable business. Uh, in the world and here in, in, in Peru too, but we want to take into account the, those, those, those interests. And for example, this, this morning um, we have signed a, a, 
uh, an agreement with a social entrepreneur here in, uh, in, in Peru, uh, in the presence of uh, Mrs. Carolina Trivelli, um, uh, Minister for, for Social Inclusion. Um, and we consider a small piece, of course, but a piece and, and, and several pieces to, uh, to be sure that, that the, uh, the sustainability of our activity, uh, producing and selling power and energy, is made at the end also in the interest of the largest part of the population. Thank you, sir. Luis Alberto. Now, uh, you're Mr. Latin America himself. I mean, you deal <laughs> with Latin America all the time. Uh, brilliant ambassador when I met you. Uh, probably more even brilliant now. A potent, greatly potential political figure, which you not only are potential, you already are an acting uh, uh, leader in Latin America. How <laughs> things have changed <laughs> for Luis Alberto since you took over the presidency of the, of the IDB, of the Inter-American Development Bank, are the challenges the same? Have they changed? And if so, how have they changed? No, I think there's been a, a profound change in Latin America. And I think a testament to that is kind of the attention a meeting like this in Lima uh, and the previous meetings coming up to Lima uh, demonstrate, because in essence what you see is a larger turnover uh, of people coming in, bigger numbers of people coming to this kind of conference. And it's for something that, uh, that Gerard said, you know, he talked about a two-speed uh, growth in the economies of the world. The IMF recently talked about three speeds. But regardless of that, we are in a time where emerging markets are at a minimum growing at twice the rate of developed markets. And that probably will happen for the next three or four or five years. Now, that is happening in a, in a very interesting context where if we were sitting here 15 years ago, the main discussion would be about macroeconomics, would be about stability, would be about debt overhang, would be about the big fiscal deficits, current accounts deficits. That's no longer the conversation here. That's more the conversation in Europe and in the developed countries. And as such, our larger conversation is about microeconomics. It is about the combination of things that we need to do to fix many of the gaps that we've had for many years. And of course, one of those key gaps is around the notion of social inclusion and how growing for the sake of growing without inclusion has a tremendous amount of problems for countries. But we also have infrastructure gaps, and I relate this basically to some of the points that Gerard was mentioning in terms of availability of public services and the cost of how those public services are delivered. We know well that Latin America pays a big tax, uh, and businesses pay a big tax because of the high cost of transport and energy, and we need to fix those. Uh, we have a huge talent gap and a talent gap that is growing. In fact, I saw a recent study done by Cisco that estimates that in Latin America, eh, there were about 130,000 work positions in, in uh, kind of engineering, uh, IT specialists that were not filled because we don't have that sufficient uh, amount of talent to fill those positions. And that number, if it were projected down to 2015, would about double. So we need to understand that to do this, we got to concentrate very heavily on some of the key issues that the Barnes was mentioning around education, which was a large part of the conversation here throughout, and the quality of education, and the kinds of job training that we need to do. And around the informal labor market, something that you've uh, written and talked a lot about, and we know that this is not a, a quick a solution. Uh, around the informality gap, which basically uh, has a lot to do with how uh, small and medium enterprises work. So there's no one formula, but clearly I think this requires a different kind of conversation. 
and that is that conversation that needs to happen between the public and the private sector. And that begins to show us as we look at Asia with all the success that Asia has had. You know, in Asia, 80% of the time people talk about the future and 20% about the past. I think it's that kind of conversation that we need to continuously have in Latin America. And as such, I think we will move into a different direction, which is more around the immediate challenge that we're going to have, which is breaking out of what's the so-called middle income trap, and that is how you really move thousands of Latin Americans into uh, becoming early developing countries. Thank you, uh, Luis Alberto. We now start seeing that already two of our speakers have laid an enormous amount of importance to education, which is right down your alley, uh, uh, Carlos. Uh, you have, uh, since some time now, even regarding your own idea of where investments should go, been very concerned about education in Peru, and you've actually gotten close to uh, implementing uh, solutions. Can you talk to us about that? Well, we've heard in this forum quite a bit about the, the way to prosperity is sustainable economic growth, and we've just heard that we should diversify our economies, not be so focused on commodities, uh, value added. But I think none of that will happen unless we have a good education system. And that's where right now we have our biggest challenge. If we look at our, just our report card, in K through 12, every single Latin American country is in the bottom third of the PISA rankings. It's really hard to, to go to a knowledge economy when we don't have much knowledge. If we look at universities, just a very simple stat, I googled the other day the top 100 or top 200 universities, and maybe you'll get one or two from Latin America. Um, and if we look at the skills gap, a, a recent study showed that while the uh, kids that were graduating from school and the employer, employers, 50% uh, or less, thought that they were not prepared, the universities thought that they were very prepared. About 80% of the universities think they're doing a great job. So I think that um, what we need to do is all of us need to get involved in education. I used to be a spectator. Five years ago, I was sitting there listening to everybody talk about education, um, and then I decided to get involved and uh, realized that not only is it a great for, for business in the sense that a prosperous country is going to be good for business, but it's also kind of our obligation to, to get involved. So as we looked around, uh, we, we found that there was a fascinating opportunity and that the private sector was already there, uh, much like in the small... Uh, like the mom and pop shops uh, in retailing, we had mom and pop schools. Um, so we started a chain of, of new schools in K through 12. Uh, they're called Innova schools, so we, we want to innovate, do different things. It's bilingual education. It's uh, focused on the emerging middle class, uh, $100 to $150 a month. Today we have 19 schools, uh, 9,200 students and uh, changing the, the, the academic model, because unless you start at the bottom, you can't really expect kids that go to poor public or private schools to become all of a sudden great university graduates. And it's turned out to be a really interesting opportunity, not just to, to, to do good, but also to do well as a business. And uh, there's some other great examples in, in different countries. There's one here uh, where a, a businessman um, is, is helping uh, start a new university, and uh, his goal is not just to be another university, it's to compete with MIT. And so the graduates from that university in Peru can work in Chile, can work in Brazil, and other places. So um, we should really create a sense of urgency because I'm not sure if these conditions will, will be repeated in our lifetime. You know, there's 600 people in our region, 600 million people in our region. Half of them are less than 30 years old. In the case of Peru, 60% of our population is below 30. And unless we get started now, we're going to miss probably the greatest opportunity that we have to really go up to the, to the next level. Now, in our case, we, we like the industry so much that we bought a university and then an institute. So the way we see it is we have 45,000 uh, team members in, in our companies, and we have 45,000 students, whether it's K through 12 or institute or universities. So if you take an average Peruvian family of five people, 
a, that's about 100, 500,000 people that we can directly affect. So we really take this very seriously and uh, think that it's not incompatible to, 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 to really focus on the social side and also uh, be fair to your shareholders and, and get good returns. What I'm starting to take away from this just before we pass uh, the microphone to uh, the audience is that everybody here has been very concerned about what we're going to do in Latin America at the ground level. You were pointing out, uh, Luis Alberto, that you know, if we had had a conversation 15 years ago, we would have been on the macro. And now here, we Latin Americans are realizing, and uh, also the investors uh, and contractors in Latin America from abroad, from Europe, are very concerned on how things are taking place on the ground and to make your activity uh, comply with local situations. The sharing that you talked about, Mr. Mistrayarov, which is definitely something that inspires us all because that's where we should be looking. But as we look to the ground, and, uh, uh, and this is also called the World Economic Forum, uh, I have a feeling that when I look to the sky, there's a macroeconomic storm also coming around. And that macroeconomic storm, which you are now feeling in Europe to a great extent, and uh, which we know that in the United States, to another extent, it is being shoved into the future as money is pumped in from government into the private economy to compensate for credit, private credit. The ability of these success, especially in Latin America, depend on the, in a way, uh, a certain financial inclusion that can be achieved. And that's, I think, the bet that any internationally active enterprise is doing, knowing that a lot is happening here. There is a rebalancing between Asia and Latin America, but one of the key issues is to make sure that this progress in Latin America is affecting each year a bigger proportion of the, of the population, which, by the way, will probably boost the consume and which may make some of these countries a little bit less dependent on what is happening in the so-called mature markets. Luis Alberto, let me try another angle. I'm trying to make life, of course, as uncomfortable as possible because <laughs> I'm at the service of the audience. Here we have in Latin America, you've been very involved in that, and that's, of course, also what uh, Carlos is, is doing, is defining very clearly what rights are about. Every time we talk in Peru, we start saying, who's responsible for what? Is it the private sector? Is it the public sector? And if it's the private sector, who is it? We want to make every time people more accountable. Now, Luis Alberto, you deal in Latin America, but you, of course, see money, which is international, flowing in every direction. I get the impression as a Latin American that one of the things, and as you were saying, Mr. Lie, is let's not talk about emerging because already countries that have emerged sometimes forget what they should have learned sometime before, that when you ask a Latin American company for its balance sheet to find out who it is, who owns it, what the interests are, you generally get a balance sheet. But when the recession started, to which my impression is that it hasn't finished, it's just been delayed, when Enron first broke, and they were asked for the balance sheets. They showed 3,200 balance sheets. And when you go to Europe or the United States and you start saying, do you have a balance sheet? They said, yes, the bad bank or the good bank? Do you feel we've started behaving better than these Europeans? <laughs> <laughs> to me? Uh, mm. Well, I, I, uh, I certainly think that um, in speaking about financial crises, if you think for a minute that Latin America in a space of 25 years had 31 financial crises, uh, we probably have a postdoctoral degree in dealing with them. Uh, but I think each crisis is different. In terms of how the private sector has changed, certainly the informal sectors well, they don't have, as you know well, you've written plenty about this, as I said earlier, uh, all of these transparent set of books, let's call them. 
But that's not the case of the more formalized businesses that are growing. Uh, because at the end, one of the good things that has happened is that in the same fashion that markets began to price risk after the financial crisis daily, and by the way, today you have countries like Peru or Chile or Colombia that the market price every day has very low risks. It created an externality, and that externality was that macroeconomics mattered in an equal fashion. I think more and more businesses have begun to understand that paying taxes is important for that notion that uh, Gerard was mentioning about shared value. And I think governments have also done, I mean, we recently published a very interesting study about taxation. And there's a huge amount of, of uh, fiscal reforms that have been done over the past uh, decade and a half. There's still a lot uh, that needs to be done because many of these fiscal reforms allow for a lot of uh, gaps and, and ways that, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't get the kind of impact you would have otherwise wanted from the fiscal perspective. But I do believe that little by little financial institutions and better tax administrations have contributed to a more, let's call it, a truthening of balance sheets, especially as you have companies that increasingly are becoming global and as such are listing themselves into the stock markets. And I'm sure that Carlos could uh, perhaps participate in something like this because he sees it as a banker every day, but I'm, that's my impression. I get that impression. I get that impression as well. I think you wanted to talk, Mr. Uh, about this, uh, Mr. Mistrayen. Uh, did I understand it or? Yes. Oh, yeah. Just because, you know, this is really, this actually takes us into French philosophy, which I'm a great admirer of. There was a philosopher, Baudillard, who brought the idea of the world of hyperrealité, right? <laughs> so there was uh, all sorts of... Uh, hyperrealité is the general idea that in the world you live in more than one sense of reality. Talking about insurance, mm -hmm. insurance is where? It's not a physical thing. It has to do with numbers, with papers, so it lives in a different world of reality. Hyperrealité goes one third, third above that, which is when the papers not only don't reflect reality, they create a completely different one. And the film, uh, uh, the film, uh, re, re, the, that, I forget what the name, the famous film that was done where, you know, where you had a computerized world, Matrix, mm -hmm. is based on French philosophy. <laughs> is there a chance that Europeans have moved into an hyperrealité where we in Latin America, what paper we have as a, uh, uh, Luis Alberto says, it's simple, but it's what you got. Well, you guys have gotten really complicated, and all of a sudden, not even the International Bank of Settlements can tell you one month in advance which is the next crisis that's going to happen in Europe. Have we gone into the world of third and fourth realities? Yes, I wanted to... <clears throat> To tell the story uh, we have been living uh, over the, the last 15 years, because of what you were speaking about the transformation of uh, Latin America, and I am a, a strong believer in, in Latin. Um, you know, my group 15 years ago decided to, to uh, um, give up its activities, which are in banking, and we, we changed completely our activities. We decided to try to become a player in energy and the environment. And so we started being relatively small in, in Europe, and uh, we decided to go abroad, to invest in uh, Latin America, in Middle East, in, in Asia. And uh, at this time, it was common to consider that there was a huge uh, country risk in investing in Latin America or in, in Asia. And in fact, we, we had taken in our investment criteria uh, a very significant risk premium uh, because of the, the change in the uh, governments, revolutions, um, and therefore uh, many potential accidents hitting the profitability of the foreign investments. And we were considering, on the contrary, that was a uh, all the, the 
the finance world were considering that there was no country risk in Europe. We have invested a lot, and um, with only one exception, which is in Argentina, where uh, 10 years ago, um, it happened to us what is happening now to Repsol. It's the same, it was Aguas Argentinas, the, the water activities in, in uh, Buenos Aires. But with, I exclude this, this exception. In all the other countries, we have invested massively here in this country, uh, close to 2 billion uh, US dollars. You're the second presence of foreign investment in Peru, are you not? Yeah. Uh, in Chile, uh, in Brazil, we are the, the, the first private power producer in, in Brazil, uh, but also in, in many countries in Asia, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and, um, uh, and Middle East, in all the countries around the Gulf. And 15 years later, I can say that the, the country risk did not happen, did not materialize. On the contrary, in Europe, because of the change of the regulation, the change in the uh, uh, energy policy in Europe, European energy policy, is a, a failure today, is a failure. Uh, because of all that changes, because also of the, every country decided uh, to, um, to transform the rules of the game at its own level, I consider that the the country risk has a change of continent and crossed over the oceans to come now to be concentrated in Europe and uh, no longer as in the countries we have chosen in Latin America. Thank you. That gives us an idea that Latin America, in relative terms, is maturing even in areas that we wouldn't have thought that it was doing it. Our paper is getting better simpler, not that extended, but uh, we've learned some of the lessons. I think we go now to the audience. Uh, you, uh, please, can you give us short questions that uh, our panel here will answer in the next few minutes before we close? Alejandro Solalinde, un cura católico. I'm from Mexico. I am a priest. From since I participated, well, I've been participating in all of these roundtables, and I've heard how optimistic people are about continued growth. The middle class is continuing to grow, but there are uh, there's the issue of migrants. The migration is a sign of structural decomposition. And yet, you're not talking about the 50 million poor people in the United States, the similar number uh, of poor people in the United States, and the very poor people as well in Central America. So how can we compare your optimistic vision with these brutal conditions that we're experiencing in Central America and other parts of the world? How can we strike a better balance in that? And have you also thought that in Central America that something might be done to help this area that is so uh, lagging so far behind? Plus, I think you wanted to meld it with another thought. Well, it was really uh, to try to come back to, you know, what are the, what's the impact of all of this in, in, in Latin America? And um, I was struck by your point about a, a hyper-reality. I mean, the, re the problem is about talking about a hyper-reality is that this has social consequences. So even if you have a financial and banking sector that is dealing in some kind of other uh, reality, it has consequences for people on the ground. And, the key, well, one of the key questions that has emerged for me over the last couple of days here is, yes, there is uh, a big discussion about social transformation, investment, and so on, but what I still don't have is any kind of sense of whether or not there is a shared, a shared understanding now between the public and private sector about the importance of that social investment for longer-term sustainability. So you're asking the questions about is what is happening in, in Europe and elsewhere going to eventually hit this region? And if so, what are the likely consequences going to be? 
the kind of fallback in a way against that is the investment that is made now in terms of the importance of putting people, jobs and education at the centre of that development. But is that a shared understanding? It, we've talked about shared value, but is there a shared understanding between the public and private sector about the need to make that kind of social investment? Right. Another question, please. While we find out if there's an arm that's been raised, uh, do you think that there is this shared understanding now between private sector, you deal with both, the private sector and the public sector? I'd like to, before I, I do, I'll quickly answer the question on, on Central America. I mean, if anything that we find today, Latin America is an extremely heterogeneous region today. There's very many different countries and there's differences within countries. Uh, and certainly, I think all of the conversation around how to do these public-private partnerships around social inclusion, understanding that there is a capacity for the private sector to innovate much more than the government can. At the end, it is in that partnership which I believe that there is a growing interest on both sides. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, at the bank, created an office of partnerships precisely for that purpose, for the purpose of uh, working uh, with institutions around this table. We do different kinds of things in microinsurance or in things related to a public good like uh, water and sanitation. So I think there's a tremendous interest in trying to get these things right. But that requires a very uh, deep conversation and one understanding that at the end, the private sector can innovate to a point, but the scaling up of this will remain a responsibility of the public sector because that's where budgets are allocated and that's how government expenditures take place. The other thing is this, you know, we live in a, in a very interesting time going back to the question of immigration. If you look at the aggregate numbers, for the first time we're seeing less people leaving Latin America than before. And in a way, we have a reverse set of trends where capital is now going south to north as we see big global Latin American companies investing overseas and as we see talent coming into the region for certain type of uh, disciplines. And I think that's a reverse trend that if we are successful at fixing some of these gaps that we have, we'll perhaps see more of that. <laughs> I have been told that now, unfortunately, we have reached uh, the end of our, uh, of, uh, our meeting and uh, from what I gather from, the, uh, from everything that uh, has been said so far, among you there is, first of all, uh, a, uh, a hope, uh, a fundamental uh, uh, faith based on your experience on what's happening in so-called emerging markets like us. There's a good trend. Uh, I think it's very interesting. You're moving away from banking to the solid stuff. I think it's very telling. And uh, it sounds not only like a wise investment, it certainly is good for, Latin, it's certainly good, good for Latin America. It's interesting to see the private sector, uh, like Carlos, getting, finding the joint between the world of uh, private profit and the world of education, of doing social good. But as you say, uh, um, <clears throat> Luis Alberto and Baroness, as you indicate yourself, it is, there is no such thing as a private sector if there is no rule of law. And the rule of law is what government gives. And uh, there still are many ways of governing our countries that hasn't been yet totally been decided. Uh, and it's going to be obviously a, uh, a very current, um, uh, it's going to be a current subject because it's obvious that the world is changing. It's obvious that the capitalist mode has always adjusted. As a matter of fact, its survival over 500 years, or as Marx would have said 400 years ago, is because it's a very, very flexible sort of thing. I remember when I studied economics, in your French-speaking part of the world, they would say, le capitalisme est comme un arbre, aux branches flexibles et le tronc solide et les racines profondes, which is that capitalism has very flexible branches, but is rooted in very 
solid instinct. So we are, I think, at one of those moments when the tree no se rompe, pero se dobla. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to know the World Economic Forum is roaming Latin America to take advantage of all your opinions. And I want to thank you for that because it is obviously for us Peruvians a luxury to have minds like yours, ce penchant, leaning on uh, our current problems. I would like to invite now Marisol Largueta to the stage, to the lectern, uh, to close the meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. De Soto. I cannot think how we could have better concluded the Eighth World Economic Forum on Latin America, having such a great panel, such a great moderator. It's been very, very insightful, very encouraging, and, and very provocative as well. I think Latin America has indeed a promise ahead, and it's our time and our responsibility to fulfill it. So thank you very much. I want to thank again our co-chairs. I want to thank every one of the participants, every one of the ministers of Peru that have been so supportive and so engaged in making sure that this is the meeting where we can come together and work on Latin America together to fulfill that promise that Latin America has to offer. Um, I also want to thank, in a very special way, our Peruvian co-chair, Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, who since many years ago has been telling us we need to come to Peru. And I thank you, Carlos, for your vision, because indeed we had to come to Peru. And we hope this is not the, the last time we're here. I hope that we may come back again and show the world the success stories that you have all built and many more success stories that Latin America is about to build. I would like to ask my managing director, Borge Brende, to join me here so that we may share with you where we are going next year to continue with our discussions and to continue with our engagement with Latin America in 2014. Thank you very much. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the forum, thank you to Marisol and her team uh, for an extraordinary uh, job in making this uh, summit on Latin America happening. Thank you also to the government of Peru. Thank you to our co-chairs and also to this uh, great panel. For me, uh, this has been um, a very important meeting in the sense that we have had a chance to go a little deeper to understand also why Latin America has weathered uh, the worst economic crisis since the 1930s better than a lot of other regions of the world. I think we also have seen that there are great opportunities for uh, this uh, part of the world, for Latin America. One of the opportunities are, of course, based on the fact that there are 267 million young people under the age of 25 years old in this part of the world. Of course, there comes challenges with this. There has to be created 50 million new jobs in the coming 10 years. There is access to education, but we know that uh, among uh, the 40 highest ranking countries in the world, according to OECD uh, PISA report, no, when it comes to quality of education, uh, none of them are in Latin America, so we need to work on that. We also know that the growth has been partly based on natural resources and commodities, and Latin America has to then also produce higher up in the value chain. It's about competitiveness, but it's also about productivity. But at the same time, I feel there is a spirit and a willingness to implement the necessary policies to create opportunities that are necessary for the young generations being and seeing um, and, and then growing up in this part of the world. So, going then from um, uh, then Peru and uh, into next year, 
uh, we're very pleased uh, that uh, we're moving from one of the fastest growing economies of Latin America, Peru, to another one that is in fact the fastest growing one. So next year, we will uh, invite you all, because we are part of the Latin America community, uh, to go to Panama. Welcome in 2014 to Panama.